two magnetic storm watch and Orionid meteor shower. We're expecting a G1 class storm, it's possible October 24th, 25th, as solar wind will be hitting Earth's magnetic field. And also, we have clear skies at a lot of places still, we'll be able to see the beautiful fireballs from this meteor shower. We are in solar minimum, we have no sunspots, but we, for those of us who, that is, who are in the uh, northern and southern hemispheres, we'll be able to still see strangely beautiful auroras around the poles, deep in the Arctic Circle, and uh, the southern, of course, uh, circle. Now we are expecting a geomagnetic storm, G1 class. Geomagnetic storms possible October 24th or 25th because the stream of solar wind will be hitting Earth's magnetic field and the gaseous material is flowing at 700 kilometers per second from a large hole in the sun's atmosphere. The auroras could descend into the northern tier U.S. states from Maine to Washington, so that's pretty low. The Orionid meteor shower peaking today specks of dust from Halley's Comet slamming into Earth's atmosphere at 148,000 miles per hour I looked last night we had a clear sky over Athens, Greece I didn't see any but I wasn't out too long now the Orionid meteor shower usually shortened to the Orionids is the most prolific meteor shower it's associated, as I said, with Halley's Comet. They're so-called because the points they appear to come from, called the Radiant, lies in the constellation Orion, hence Orionids, but they can be seen over a large area of the sky. The Orionids are an annual meteor shower, lasting approximately one week, late October, that's where we are now, and in some years, meteors may occur at rates of 50 to 70 every hour. So that's just about one a minute. Meteor showers first designated shooting stars. So that's where we have fireballs or shooting stars connected to comets in the 1800s. And this is what we'll be lucky enough to be able to see if we have clear skies. Now, according to space weather, the geomagnetic storm is expected 24th to 25th. Solar speed that we have now is 356.4 kilometers per second and density of 4.6 protons per cubic centimeter. X-ray solar flares, 6-hour maximum A7, 24-hour A7. And uh, I'll leave a link below for your space so that you can see this. There's a video, a few seconds, of the uh, oriented fireball streaking across uh, New Mexico camera. All Sky Fireball Network by NASA All Sky Cameras scans the skies above the United States for meteoritic fireballs, and that's what we have now. And uh, today they had a network of 97 reported fireballs. Uh, automated software maintained by NASA's Meteoroid Environment Office calculates their orbits, their velocity, penetration depth into Earth's atmosphere, and other characteristics. Daily results are presented here on spaceweather.com. The diagram of the uh, fireballs in the inner solar system, all of the fireballs' orbits intersect at a single point, and that is Earth. I always, really always, ask myself about that. How is it that they're always intersecting at only single a single point being Earth? That's very strange. The orbits are color-coded by velocity from slow being red to fast being blue. We also have a listing here of near-Earth uh, Earth asteroids or potentially hazardous asteroids. The space rocks larger than 300 feet across, 100 meters across that can come close to Earth closer than 0 0.05 AU. 1 AU is, as we know, the distance between the Sun and the Earth, which is about 93 million miles. None of the known potentially hazardous asteroids, PHAs, is on a collision course with our planet, although astronomers are finding new ones all the time. 
Now, on October 22nd, 2019, today that is, there are 2018 potentially hazardous asteroids. Now, the next one uh, on the list is October 25th. The missed distance is, no, October 22nd to October 23rd, I'm sorry, not 25th, 23rd. The missed distance is four and a half lunar distances. The velocity is pretty slow. It's, uh, tw oh, no, it's not slow, it's 12 kilometers per second. The diameter is 11 meters. That's about 33 feet. It's small. But the thing with the small ones is that the Yarkovsky effect could have a very quick effect on them because of the solar radiation, the sun's heat, heating the surface of the uh, celestial rock means that it causes it very much more easily to tumble on its axis and it's as if something is striking it and causing it to leave its trajectory and that's how one of these small ones I think it was 45 feet across on July 25th was supposed to pass beyond the moon into the depths of space and it didn't it came hurtling towards us and it came and uh, impounded us into the Caribbean Ocean. Of course, uh, it was the ocean, and it was small enough that it didn't cause any type of a damage. But the astronomers had to come out and give us a little bit of a lesson as to why that happened. Why did it leave its trajectory? Why did it behave properly going into the wild blue darkness of space and careening into our planet? And they said it was the Yarkovsky effect, that is the sun's heat heating the surface of the comet, the asteroid, whatever it was, this little piece of uh, uh, asteroid, and causing it to tumble off its axis, leaving its trajectory, and it fell into the Earth, onto, uh, into the Caribbean Ocean, thank goodness. So that's the listing, you can see it here. Also we have cosmic rays coming in, a lot more now that we have solar minimum. Cosmic rays in the atmosphere, uh, they developed a new productive, uh, predictive model of aviation radiation called ERAD for short, Empirical Radiation Model. They're constantly flying radiation sensors on board planes over the U.S. and internationally, and so far collected more than 22,000 GPS-tagged radiation measurements. And using this data set, they can predict the dosage on any flight over the U.S. with an error of no worse than 15 percent. Basically, they have a hot flight table and uh, it uh, tells you that, okay, how much more radiation you have above sea level, uh, depending on how high you are and how many hours you are in the flight. Of course, the higher you are, the incrementally more radiation you're exposed to. And of course, the more hours you're in flight, the more radiation you're exposed to. You can take a look at this as well. Now, uh, space weather balloons. The students of Earth to Sky Calculus fly space weather balloons to the stratosphere over California. These balloons are equipped with radiation sensors detecting cosmic rays at surprisingly down-to-earth form of space weather. The cosmic rays can seed clouds. They're very dangerous. They can seed clouds trigger lightning, and penetrate commercial airplanes. So there's nothing really to stop them. And also, there are studies linking cosmic rays with cardiac arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death in the general population. You can understand how dangerous these things are. With our latest measurements, they say they show that cosmic rays are intensifying with an increase of more than 18% since the year 2015. 18 percent, let's say 20 percent, 2015. Since 2015, 18 percent, this goes up to what? Uh, today, I guess. Whatever. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. It's uh, almost uh, 25 percent, I would say, and uh, that's bad. The data points in the graph correlate to the peak of the Renger Fotzer mix maximum, lying about 67,000 feet above central California. When cosmic rays crash into Earth's atmosphere 
they produce a spray of secondary particles that is most intense at the entrance to the atmosphere. Physicist Eric Reniger and George Fotzer discovered the maximum using balloons in the 1930s, and that's what they're measuring. That's how they measure them today. Also, uh, doses, all right, dose rates at, at express, are expressed as multiples of sea level. For instance, if we see that boarding a plane that flies 25,000 feet exposes passengers to doses rates at 10 times higher than sea level, at 40,000 feet, the multiplier is closer to 50 times higher than sea level. So you can understand how much more it is. Radiation sensors on board helium balloons detect X-rays and gamma rays in the energy range of 10 keV to 20 MeV. These energies span the range of medical X-ray machines and airport security scanners. Now, why are these cosmic rays intensifying? The main reason is that the sun. We are uh, in a solar minimum. Solar storm clouds such as coronal mass ejections also sweep aside cosmic rays. But we don't have that now because we're in a solar minimum. When they pass the Earth, these uh, so, uh, cosmic, uh, coronal mass ejections, CMEs, um, sweep aside cosmic rays. During solar maximum, CMEs are abundant and cosmic rays are held at bay. But that's not what we have now. Right now we're in a solar minimum, therefore the cosmic rays are free to wander and enter our atmosphere and do their damage. Now the solar cycle is swinging towards solar minimum, allowing the cosmic rays to return. Another reason could be the weakening of Earth's magnetic field, and that also helps us protect us from deep space radiation, Earth's magnetic field. But if it's weakening, that means the cosmic rays again are more free to enter. I'll leave links below for you for this on space weather. And again, those of you who are lucky enough to have clear skies, you'll be able to see uh, just about one a minute these Orionids meteor showers from Halley's Comet. Now, as for the geomagnetic storm and the G1 class uh, storm that we're expecting, G1 minor geomagnetic storm impacts power systems means that weak power grid fluctuations can occur. Spacecraft operations means that minor impact on satellite operations are possible. And other systems, migratory animals are affected at this and higher levels. Aurora is commonly visible at higher altitudes, northern Michigan and Maine, and that's what we were told, of course. So because of this, you can see auroras, northern Michigan and up to Maine, which is pretty low. It's lower than the Canadian border, so that's great for those of you who are there. I'll leave links below for you for this on space weather. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on, not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today more of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.